Hi folks, we're just giving a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let folks in before we get started with tonight's event. If you are already in tonight's webinar with us, um, you're welcome to open up your chat window. Let us know where you're Zooming in from. And you can also find some information in the chat about how to purchase tonight's featured book, Mother Care. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Lynn Tillman presenting her new book, Mother Care. She'll be talking with Katie Kitamura, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Lynn, Katie and the team at Soft Skull for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Mother Care, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Lynn and Katie's books and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop that by link in the chat. And as thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. Our interviewer tonight is Katie Hidamura. Katie's most recent novel is Intimacies, one of the New York Times 10 best books of 2021 and one of Barack Obama's favorite books of 2021. It was long listed for the National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award and was a finalist for the Joyce Carol Oates Prize. She is also the author of A Separation, Gone to the Forest, and The Long Shot. She'll be speaking with our featured author, Lynn Tillman. Lynn is a novelist, short story writer, and cultural critic. Her novels include Haunted Houses, Motion Sickness, Cast in Doubt, No Lease on Life, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, American Genius, A Comedy, and Men in Apparitions. She is the recipient of the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship and the Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. Tillman is professor writer in residence in the Department of English at the University of Albany and lives in New York with bass player David Hofstra. Lynn's new book, Mother Care, is, as quoted by Literary Hub, both a treatise on the grueling obligation of caregiving and an ineffectual American healthcare system, as well as the frank recounting of loving and living with a difficult parent. Lynn is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with, with Katie and with all of you. Lynn, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction, and I feel very fortunate to be talking with Katie Kitamura and her her books um, are wonderful and intimacies is just extraordinary. And I love to separation also. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to read um, uh, a few pages from Mother Care. And uh, it's an odd book to read a part of, but I think this part works on its own. Over the 11 years, emergencies, domestic conflicts have Oh, sorry. 
emerge, domestic conflicts have me racing to mother's apartment. One morning I st stood beside her and watched bright red blood gush from her mouth. I don't know how, but I took her to the ER by cab or ambulance, I can't recall. I knew what the problem was. She had become nauseated taking Tylenol with codeine. I do too. And she couldn't stop throwing up after vomiting violently her esophagus tore. I didn't know that, but Dr. A did. Mother spent all day in the hospital undergoing unnecessary tests. I told the intern in charge, mother lying on a bed in the ER, codeine was the problem. We both vomited from it. He ignored me and ordered unnecessary tests, even though in an encyclopedia of, illness, of illnesses, a handbook right beside him on a table, the first side effect associated with codeine was vomiting. Mother was wheeled off for tests somewhere, and hours later, no one could find her. She had been lost in a hospital hallway. I raced through the halls and found her lying impassively out of it and on a lonely gurney. Interminable, enervating waiting. Hospitals suck life from you. This visit or another, a social worker asked my New York sister and me to come to her office, where she asked questions that puzzled my sister. The social worker was assessing us to see if we were abusing mother. It happens, the elderly are abused. Anyone can be abused, wealthy or poor, when incapacitated, everyone is prey to sadists. Being suspected of that, definitely unpleasant. In a hospital, your sick parent in a room, she's in pain, moaning, crying, or something weird is happening. You run to the nurse's station looking for immediate help. Maybe no one pays attention. Then you shout for help. It happens. Watching someone in pain breaks every rule of decorum. In that plush hospital room, waiting and waiting for a doctor to see mother who needed immediate care, worry mounting, I was reminded of that scene in terms of endearment when Shirley MacLaine playing the mother, witnessing, witnesses her dying daughter, played by Deborah Winger, suffering in agony. McLean totally loses it, runs to the nurse's station, rages and screams at the nurses to help her daughter. She doesn't stop until one of them goes to help her. McLean calms down, stands up straighter, arranges her blouse, pats herself down, literally to straighten herself out, pull herself together. These gestures were perfect visual metaphors. I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, Lynn. Um, that was really wonderful to hear you read from this extraordinary book. And I'm so delighted to finally be speaking with it. Uh, sorry, speaking with you about it. You know, it was really um, made such an impression on me when I first read it some time ago. So it's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. Thank um, you. I was remembering that I think it was a couple of years ago, maybe that you sent me an email and you said that to your surprise, you found yourself during lockdown writing about your mother. And I wondered if I could just start with a really basic question, which is how you came to be writing this book, particularly, you know, right during that period of lockdown. I, um, so my mother died in 2006 after 11 years of uh, her being dependent on me and my sisters and many caregivers. And after she died, about a year later, I started to write what I thought would be an essay, short essay on basically what I had learned about hospitals and doctors and all of that. And I, I got into it about 14 pages. It wasn't difficult. I mean, I was just recounting. It was very present for me. And I realized I had to stop because I didn't want to relive those 11 years again. And so after my last novel came out, Men in Apparitions, in about 2019, I started to think about mother care again, and then came lockdown. And so lockdown, you know, gave me this time to be I was to, in solitude. Uh, David and I were in our little house in Hudson and 
nothing intruded except the horribleness of everything. <laughs> but I could write this this book. And I think those 11 years were indelibly imprinted in mm -hmm. my memory. I hope now to forget a lot of it. Once you mm -hmm. put it into a book, you can start forgetting it. But it was, um, it was, you know, going back, uh, a lot just came to me and my memory is often quite visual. And mm -hmm. so I was seeing things. I also had my diaries from those 11 years and I don't keep a, a good diary. I mean, I just note things down and sometimes I would have, you know, mother's operation today or mm -hmm. something like that. And I had some calendars mm -hmm. uh, that, from my mother's apartment that marked when she had certain doctor's appointments and stuff. But mostly it was really memory. And, you know, one memory, as you know, one memory unlocks another. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going to say it's like those Russian dolls, but, <laughs> you know, but you never do get the, to the tiniest memory, I think you know, the smallest in the inside. But yeah, it. I, I, I'm it so intrigued by the a fact that this started as an essay. I, I think you've said that it's it's not a memoir and it, it certainly doesn't feel like a memoir to me. And, and you said it's not a personal essay, but what you call an autobiographical essay. Is that, yes. is that right? Yes. Can you can you share a little bit about the distinctions um, and, and, and what makes it specifically an autobiographical essay rather than a personal essay or, or a memoir? Well, um, um, in a memoir, I would not be writing so much about my mother or her medicines mm -hmm. or I, that, that would not be my subject. Uh, this, this is a, um, a discussion in some way of, of those 11 years and what happened to my mother and from my point of view. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's autobiographical. I'm, it's about my relationship to this period in my mother's life. I think the personal essay, which is a, a term that I really can't stand, <laughs> uh, because, you know, in some way, if you're writing an essay, whatever it is, it is sort of personal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, we used to use the term, or I, I don't think I ever used it, but there is the term belle left, and uh, that would have stood for what is now called personal essay. Mm -hmm. Also, the use of personal. Um, I don't I don't feel about this book that it's personal. I think mm -hmm. it's quite <laughs> objectified. I think mm -hmm. I'm seeing myself as a as a character mm -hmm. in this drama, although I expose things that I actually felt, which is mm -hmm. something that I don't do mm -hmm. in my fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's interesting because at the very start of the book you you kind of are quite careful to say that this is subjective and it's your experience only and that your sisters for example might have experienced these events differently but then you are absolutely scrupulous it seemed to me as a reader about being as honest and a, as objective as possible in your recounting both of what happened to your mother in the healthcare system in the United States and also your own relationship to her was that was that the tone that you needed in order to write that book or was that a tone that you had to work to maintain uh i think both uh mm -hmm. I, I i did want not to make it sentimental i didn't want i wasn't writing it to get sympathy from readers i don't expect sympathy i think this is something that happens to millions over 50 million apparently in this situation now in the states um it's a domestic drama i mm -hmm. in the book i at one point call it a domestic tragedy mm -hmm. uh, what happens um among us uh my mother the person who is taking care of her francis and myself uh and that's gone into, you have to read the whole book to understand what the tragedy is. So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> to, I mean, you know, but I'm not going to tell the, the audience. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know, I, I wrote this 
in a way clinically. Uh, one thing happens, then another thing happens. And uh, I, I was going in, in my mind, it, I was traveling through this past that was still very present to me. I think this is um, in most people's lives, the caring for a sick parent or mm -hmm. child is very is a great drama in your own life. It's every moment feels urgent. Uh, you never know when you're going to be called upon, or maybe the person mm -hmm. is living with mm -hmm. you. It's it's ongoing, and it's a part of life. I thought when I decided to really get into this book, that's that's really underspoken about. You know, I think I I think that the difficulty of being in this situation, and not as a victim, not, and not as a patient but um, as someone who is called called up in a way you mm -hmm. know to be a sort of soldier in this battle mm -hmm. uh and often unwilling i was i was quite unwilling i mean i did it but mm -hmm. i didn't want to be doing it mm -hmm. and i think that that's quite common and i think for some people it was much much it has been even much more much worse than it was for me. I think that leads to kind of two, two thoughts. One is that there's a really, um, you said that you started writing the essay because you wanted to share what you had learned. And there is this wonderful quality in the book where you are giving us information about how to cope with the situation that will likely happen to many of us. And then I guess the, uh, and I, I wondered how you, you came to that, that tone and the kind of balance of keeping it from feeling you know, self-help is not the word, but you know, to keep it from curdling into something else. And I guess the other question I had is, is this is a, is a, a book that's really concerned about ethics and morality and about the question of how we treat other people, um, yes. regardless of the specifics of the emotion and the relationship. So in this book, I would say in some ways, it's really animated by your relationship with your mother and the relationship with Francis, the, the primary caregiver who looks after your mother for right. 10 years. So I guess I, you know, I don't want to ask if there's a kind of ethics involved to sharing the information, but I wondered how, where that impulse came from. And then I guess I'd love to hear a little bit of how you untangle the kind of morality of, of care. That's a very, very good question because it's central to the book. Um, and it was always in my mind. And as a narrative writer, and this is a narrative book, it is telling a, a story yes. in which these, um, these clues to how to deal with a doctor <laughs> are wrapped into that narrative. They're, they're not the outstanding part of it. Um, I, did, I do feel that ethics are um, part of narrative in that there's always, I think, uh, a disputation, an argument in narrative. Uh, there's some way in which in a story, there's um, a, a kind of dialectic uh, between characters, perhaps. I mean, Intimacy is a perfect example of a book that is centrally uh, about ethics, and it's, it's just brilliantly done. I, I loved it. Thank you. And so I knew I knew that um, ethics were at the heart mm -hmm. of this. Every everything that we did to take care of my mother had an ethical component, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, it makes it makes this book. I think for some people it will be hard to 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 read in a way. It's very stark. I don't excuse myself from the dilemma. We hired a woman who was um, a person of color from the Caribbean. <clears throat> she had never had any training. Uh, she was an undocumented worker. And suddenly she's living with my mother. And she was paid at the beginning very little. That increased. Um, and, but she was never paid a lot because we didn't have that kind of money. 
she was unskilled in any other way. Uh, and she was great with my mother, absolutely great with my mother. But the question, you know, we say uh, often people say they became part of the family. Well, that's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and my niece reminded me of when um, we paid for uh, Francis's daughter's marriage and in the city and uh, for the to the restaurant, we, we, we took care of those things. So there were many other things that we helped her out with uh, and did what we could to help. And at the luncheon for the bride and groom, uh, Frances made a toast and I did not remember this. And she thanked us and she said, I wish I were a Tillman, like that. When I think about this now, I, um, it makes me very sad because there was always that difference. She was not, she was not educated. Uh, she had had baby, her first baby when she was 15. Mm -hmm. She'd had a very rough life in a lot of ways. And as she was with us, she changed. And I really loved her. And I felt really close to her. And then things happened that were mm -hmm. not, that were not good. Mm -hmm. um, but you deal with race and class, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I, in order to have avoided that, uh, I could have lived with my mother, let's say. There were two bedrooms. Um, I could have, quote, given up my life uh, if I wanted to be entirely ethical, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't want to give up my life. And mm -hmm. so I was part of a system that is not equitable. And we did, we as a family did as much as we could to make it as good as possible, paid vacations, you know, pay time, lot, you know, time off every weekend, all of those things. But it's still, it's still mm -hmm. your part of a system in which you're um, gaining mm -hmm. from somebody else's lack. I, I mean, one of the things about the book that is so powerful is a way that it holds open a space for kind of ambiguity. Nothing is really re resolved within in the book in that traditional way. And, and I was thinking there are two statements that you make in the book. One is, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's that you did not mourn your mother's death. And the second is that you didn't really know your mother. And I think in a kind of conventional narrative structure, those would be the two statements at the beginning of the book. And then at the end of the book, you would have learned to mourn your mother's death and you would know who your mother was. And, and my sense is that's absolutely not what happens at all. But in fact, that everything keeps kind of growing more and more complex. It's almost, in my head, it's almost like a structure that keeps kind of adding layers and you're kind of holding space open for these incredibly co complex ethical and and personal explorations. Um, but I did wonder, you, you said earlier that you wondered if something would change now in terms of your relationship to your memory of those 11 years through writing the book. H has anything changed for you in the process of this? Um, in another discussion uh, the other night with Christine Smallwood, yeah. uh, she said had, um, had writing the book in some ways redeemed those 11 years, because in the book I talk about how, in a sense, they felt wasted to me. I don't use those words, but that I was not happy to have been the obedient mm -hmm. daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting about making something of something that was kind of miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Um, and writing the book, I think, gave me a sense that I was doing something with that experience mm -hmm. that was outside myself. Even though I used myself um, and my experience um, and my point of view, uh, it, it felt like I was externalizing through writing, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It, it does, you know, I mean, I, I had a 
in my 20s, my father was sick with cancer for quite an extended period. And then he died when I was 29, I think. And it, it felt to me much as you, as you say, an unhappy period. And it felt like a lost decade in, in a way in my life. But at the same time, in a funny way, as he was dying, and there was such an extraordinary scene in this, in this book, in your book um, of, of, of your mother's death, I remember at that moment, I, I, I felt a kind of um, almost like a calling to witness what was, what was happening to him as closely as possible and to not look away from it because it felt very easy to look away from it. And I thought this is the one thing I can do for him. And I didn't at the time tie that in any way to writing, but in some funny way, I think that decade did inform my writing. I suppose I wonder, you know, two, two books that I thought of when I read this are Peter Hanke's um, Sorrow Beyond Dreams, which is, he wrote famously kind of in, within a f maybe a couple of weeks after his mother died by suicide. And then, and then to a lesser extent, Philip Roth's Patrimony. But I was thinking about that book because he said he already knew as his father was falling into dementia that he would write about it one day. What, was that something that occurred to you as it was happening or or was there a very kind of strict, because for me, there was a very strict, not a strict line, but it felt like there was a division between what I was experiencing and what I would write. But in the case of both Hanke and Roth, I think it very, very quickly converted into a piece of text. Not, not for me, I didn't, I wasn't thinking that during this period, uh, those 11 years. Um, I was able to write other things, uh, to maybe write a couple of novels and numbers mm. of essays and short stories. So I wasn't thinking about, uh, it was in a way, uh, you're blasted by experience. Yeah. <laughs> you're just, <laughs> you know, it's just, there's there's not a moment really to, to reflect on what's happening because mm -hmm. every moment feels like an emergency, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the only times that I really got away from that was when I was teaching or when I went to McDowell for mm -hmm. a, a, um, a month or something like that to to write. But it was always so present. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, in order to turn something into words, uh, it you you have to have distance mm -hmm. from it. I had no distance from it as mm -hmm. I was watching it all in, unfold. It was so chaotic. I think my mind was in a period of extended chaos in a way. And it's also exhausting. And um, having to be vigilant in a certain way, it was, I can't believe looking back that it actually was 11 years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because it's, I don't know how those guys, <laughs> Well, Roth, I can, I can, you know, I, Roth, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I read Sorrow Beyond Dreams yeah. years ago, years yeah. ago, and yeah. I don't re remember it well. Maybe I should read it again. What was, what was unconsciously, I think, affecting this book was Simone de Beauvoir's yes. A Very Easy Death. Yes. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I read it years and years and years ago. And I just, I was just, I was amazed by it. And she writes with a very cold hand also. Mm. Mm. And I think I wasn't aware of it as I was writing, but later, you know, when your publisher says what books, you know, I then, I then thought about that, you know. It's funny how how the books that make such an impression, they leave a kind of imprint on you that you retain unconsciously and you carry yeah. it with you all the way through the right. writing. Um, yes. I just want to quickly say um, to, to, to the audience that um, I'm gonna ask Lynn a few more questions, but please feel free to post your questions in the Q and A. Mm. I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to get mm. to those and then we'll, we'll go through this. I feel like I'm speaking, it's getting increasingly dark in my room yeah, when no, I'm speaking. I'm, I'm yeah. almost wondering, I'm, I might turn on a light if it's distracting or, no, okay, no. I'm gonna do that. It's always darkest before it's dark. Oh, wow. That's quite a nice light. Oh, is, that, is, that less, is that less disconcerting than speaking to an increasingly shadowy 
rectangle. Um, Lynn, so much of your, your work is, you know, you, you write both fiction and nonfiction and essays and criticism, and, and you kind of live in that slipstream between, between the forms. I, I wondered, did it ever occur to you to write this as a piece of fiction or was it always nonfiction for you? Was it always essay, essay for you? Always essay. I, okay. I, I think to turn it into fiction, I mean, there's fiction, you know, fiction is just to make something really from the Latin fuckery, we, to make, to do. Yes. Um, and so because I'm a narrative writer, narrative fiction writer, that comes into Mother Care in the way yes. that it's written. Yes. It's chronological in a way, but it has digressions too. But then we go back to the present of that of that book and um so there are devices used yes you know it's not i don't put life on the page i put something mediated on the page but i never thought to write it as as fiction that would be even more complicated okay. you know uh it would it would be incredibly complicated so no i i, I, I this was an, a, i wanted to account for those years I wanted to account for what I learned and, you know, going back to ethics. Yes. I thought, I thought when we got into this, when my mother got sick, I speaking for myself, I had no idea what was happening. I mean, you're thrust into something and doctors can be very intimidating, mm -hmm. uh, hospitals, all of that. Um, my, my husband broke his elbow years ago and we went to the hospital to have it put into a cast and then they said and now uh you'll have the surgery on monday with so and so i said well why should we have the surgery with that person well he's a good doctor i said but you know david is a musician and his hand and his arm is very mm -hmm. well he's a very good doctor i said but why should we use this mm -hmm. and he, she said you're already in the system. Yeah. <laughs> and what did that mean? They, they, they had his birth date and <laughs> blood types. Yeah. So we didn't, but that's the way you get wrapped into something and you think you have no way out. So I mean, that was part of it. I, I was thinking as I read it, because in so, when you were saying earlier about using devices, I mean, in a lot of ways, it is a novel. Uh, sorry, not a novel. It's a it's a book that is about transformation, though, because both Francis, the caregiver, and your mother undergo very radical transformations over the course of of the book, and and that yes. feels, if not like a structuring principle, it, it certainly is. You know, the voice of the narrator is the kind of stable point that we have as we move through this book. Where, where everything feels very unfixed, you know, identity feels unfixed. This, the medical system is frankly terrifying. I mean, I, I was breaking out into cold sweat reading, you know, I reread the, the book last night and, and it's it's harrowing to read your experiences with the health healthcare system in the United States. Um, but I, I can see how in, in a lot of ways it remains a book that is character led in, in, the, in that sense. Yes, I, I think that's that's true. There are these major characters, my mother, her caregiver. I'm the narrator of yes. all of this, <laughs> and I'm and I'm watching it. <laughs> I'm watching it, and I'm recording it in my brain, and and then I'm letting it out. You know, letting can it I, out. Can I ask just one one quick last question, which okay. is um, is is you you have a very strong kind of presence in life in the art world as well. And you wrote a regular column for Freeze magazine. I also used to write for Freeze a long time ago. I just wondered how, how the kind of process and methodology that you see in art, if that informs your writing in any way, and if so, how? Um, it does. Uh, I see in, in all different kinds of art, um, I, I see metaphors there, or I see a kind of necessity. I see spatial relations, which of course um, yes. translate into um, a different use of space in a in a book. Mm -hmm. um, 
and how you move from one thing to another. When I made um, film and in the editing room, you can cheat, you know, you can uh, make something appear to happen together when in fact there are a few seconds that you're cut out or something. Mm -hmm. And that affected my writing also, sort of cheating the eye, but cheating the brain also. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the eye is attached to me. It works because <laughs> of the brain, but just there, there are ways and from film and from art, whatever kind of art it is, that's very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I can't immediately translate it into words for myself, there's something about the immense um, uh, kinds of creativity, to mm -hmm. use that word that sometimes is benighted, how people come up with different ideas mm -hmm. is always makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me happy to see that. And I think that helps me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to um, move move to the questions and we have a few. Um, uh, the, the first question is from Lily, who says, I'm now in the midst of mother care. Oh, sorry. Uh, they wanted to make it anonymous. Um, I'm, I'm in the midst of mother care. I'm starting to write about it. If we are not of stature, do you both think there's a market for such books and essay collections? Um, after all, 78 million baby boomers are aging. And so many of us are now family caregivers. Thank you. Um, I don't so think I, much I, about I don't think much about the market. Um, really, I don't. Uh, but I think that people want to know about situations that they're going to find themselves in. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would find a, a market. I guess. Um, and there's another question. Uh, how did writing this book differ from the essay you wrote after your father's passing in the broad picture? Ah, thank you for that question. Um, am I just disappearing into darkness? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think you're yet as dire as my situation is, but it is, it is. The, I don't this, know what to do. The exactly. light is, is dropping. <laughs> Um, oh, it was, that's what I was trying as well to lean to the cat <laughs> to the camera. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I wrote that essay, which was called An Impossible Man, 10 years after my father died. Uh, and it's a very emotional, it's a much more emotional piece. It's there's no objectivity <laughs> in it, uh, mm -hmm. at all. There's it's 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 not clinical. Uh, the loss of my father was a great loss to me. And he died before he saw his youngest daughter about whom he was always concerned would never make a living, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> not that I make a huge living, but anyway, um, he would have been very happy that I became a writer, but he didn't get a chance uh, to, to see that, to see my books. So it's a much more emotional, essay and I wrote it in um, a month uh, and I think I was weeping all the time uh, just so it's I I did not weep as I wrote Mother Care but this this essay so I don't even know anymore what somebody else might feel about an impossible man the essay about my father but it was just full of feeling was that did that difference arise from the difference in your relationship with your mother versus your father or or was that something about the process of because it sounds like there was a sizable gap in both cases between the, the death writing, and the yeah. and the writing yeah right i think it had to do with my feelings about yeah. my father i uh i i love my father though he was a, a troubled person and could be quite horrible, but I, he also could be much more generous and kind than my mother. Um, one of the uh, the really extraordinary lines that is attributed to the mother is when she said, "If I'd wanted to, I would have been a better writer, better writer, than, better than, writer you. Than, than you." And 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 I was I was curious about the Gris Griselda. That there's a kind of lengthy cat 
section that she, uh, a yes. text that she wrote about the cat when, when did she write that and when did you co come across it did you know I mean did that reflect an actual ambition on her part to I think become probably, a writer or you know, you know I think she was one of the Betty Friedan generation yeah. of women who wanted to have been something other than a wife and mother but then yeah. was very much caught up in the institution of uh, and those ideas and she should not work and my father should have a you know have his company and make money and she should be at home with the children i i don't think that worked for her right. and i think uh that made her uh an unhappy mother you know um and so that wasn't good for us either mm -hmm. and she um i don't know when she wrote the cat story i don't know and i only saw it later and my mother would whenever i was praised by anyone over those 11 years my mother would say but have you seen my cat story <laughs> so she would she shared it with you as evidence of, of the fact that she could have been a better writer she, right, that's right. If, if she decided to right. um i i had an, another question which is towards the end of the book you refer to some of your previous work um that was written during the aids epidemic and i and how that affected your your experience of writing about death. I wondered how writing this book during the pandemic affected your experience of writing mother care, of writing about death here. I don't know that it did. I mean, in, in some ways locked in my house in, a, yeah. in a, a small city. So I was fortunate I could go for walks. Mm -hmm. You know, people in New York City, I think it was much more threatening mm -hmm. COVID. There was, um, it's not that there wasn't COVID up here, but there was a lot of fresh air. There was, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. there were usually nobody on a street. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you, felt, you felt safe. But I, I don't think that it did. I, I, I think that the period of the AIDS epidemic in the, uh, I mean, and still is an epidemic, excuse me, in the 80s into the 90s was uh, something that any of us who lived through that uh, can almost not articulate what it felt like. Mm -hmm. It was it, it was a, just horrifying and so strange and terrible, just mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. And there are two more questions. Um, the first is, has writing mother care made you think about how you wish to be cared for as you age or how not to be cared for? It's oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Um, unfortunately, it made it all too real that this, mm -hmm. you know, that this might be in my future. And it's pretty much, unless you just, you know, drop dead of <laughs> a mm -hmm. massive mm -hmm. heart attack. Um, most of us will need help at, at some point. And how do we get that help? I mean, many of these institutions where people are housed are terrible, yes. absolutely terrible. And because the baby boomers are such a huge group, one would think as we age that this would be a um, stimulus to finding better ways of, of, of living while not well. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that Atul Gawande wrote about in this wonderful essay about gerontology and the difference between a, a gerontologist and a internist, let's say, was that doctors don't know how to deal with decline. Mm -hmm. And that to me is very much on my mind. We decline as we get older. I mean, mm -hmm. some of us m much more terribly than others. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think about it and I have no idea what I'll do. Um, another question is, <laughs> Sorry. Um, Lynn, you mentioned exhaustion. Do you each have thoughts about the gender nuances around expectations about how perhaps daughters, femmes might be expected to care well, I think it is. Uh, yeah. This is so dark. I I turn on the light. <laughs> Feel free to turn on the light. <laughs> I, I don't know. Mm. 
Is that better? That's better. Yes, hello. Hi. <laughs> Here I am again. Uh, well, it was very gothic the other way, I think. <laughs> well, we could have both kept and in, stayed in yes, darkness, but right. through to the end. Through to the end. Um, I think the, the gendered yeah. caregiving situation is uh, oh, strictly, almost strictly enforced in a way through mm -hmm. our culture and society that women are the ones to do this and i get very upset when i see little girls playing with dolls and taking mm -hmm. care of them mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean it's to me it's uh, about teaching a girl to know how to do that to be that caregiver so early and it would be different if both girls and boys when they were young were taught to take care of each other, mm -hmm. to be uh, empathic, to, to be understanding. But often in, in families where there are men, it will be still the women of the family who take care of the, of the parents. Uh, and it's not always the case, obviously there are exceptions. I also think about people who are um, only children and the weight of that, uh, you know, being one person uh, responding to that. It's very, very, very hard, very hard. Um, how, how did gender play into your experience of within the healthcare, the machine within the system of healthcare? Huh. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, um, I focused more on how my mother was treated as an elderly woman mm. and how uh, some doctors were very dismissive mm -hmm. and others were not. Uh, I don't know if they would have behaved differently to an aging man than an aging woman. It, it seemed pretty terrible to me with some of them mm -hmm. and others not. And I, I think I I, I do tell the story that one of these doctors uh, seemed quite uninterested in my mother. And when um, we urged my, this doctor to, cause my mother was kind of comatose then. She'd had uh, a really bad um, grand mal seizure mm -hmm. and she wasn't speaking. She was mm -hmm. hardly moving, all of that. Mm -hmm. and my Carolina sister and I, we were in his office with my mother and we said, can't you do anything? I, I remember mm -hmm. saying, can't you just try something? And then he said, well, you know, hmm, Ritalin. Ritalin is good for the aging brain. And within two weeks, my mother was talking again. She was entirely different. She was out mm -hmm. of that kind of comatose state. And when we brought her back to him, he was and she was energetic and laughing with him. He was so happy and very surprised. And I think and hope that he's more creative with his mm -hmm. other patients. Well, was that experience of advocating for your mother something you had to learn over those 11 years? Or was it, as you said, in the face of pain, you become, you become someone else and you're able to, to do that? Because that's something I think about a lot is in that situation, would I be able to advocate for the people I'm, I'm caring for, the people I'm responsible for? I, um, it's, a hard, it's hard to know. With, I learned mm. I had to do it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but I think I'm a person who's quite curious anyway, and mm -hmm. I ask questions. And both of my older sisters are also people who, uh, are not going to be intimidated. Mm -hmm. Again, we're all well educated. We're all white. We're mm -hmm. all, you know, um, we we don't have the societal quote unquote deficits that would make mm -hmm. it harder for us to come mm -hmm. up against these doctors. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, I mean, you could be intimidated anyway, but you had. You, I felt I had more. Um, stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and i yeah. could 
could push. And of course, the question that's always great to ask of a doctor is, would you do this for your mother? Yeah. <laughs> That works all the time. I, 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 will, I, I will note that, Lynn. I will, I will write it down for future. <laughs> there's, there's one more question. Um, okay. Is long-term care in the U.S. is basically an immigration issue? Should we family caregivers all feel comfortable becoming advocates on the intersection of caregiving and immigration? Um, I, and this is, I think, linked to your... To your to what you were saying earlier about Francis being un undocumented and undocumented. Yeah. Yes, I think that that's um, since that's operative, it is something uh, to be concerned with. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what the question is asking, uh, what the person is asking in terms of that lo long term care is involved in immigration. Um, that's um, uh, immigrants often, uh, not often, but if they are, uh, as this woman was, uh, without an education, without a skill, really, uh, not ever having been a professional at anything. Uh, when people like this come, how how can we better deal with their situation? Because they need help um, to, to know their rights. For instance, um, mm. people often don't know mm. what their rights are. Uh, I don't know how that would be taught, maybe more centers mm -hmm. uh, for um, immigrants coming to into the country, some way of doing that work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yes um and uh lynn can i ask one last question which is are you which is the dreaded i know it's the worst question you can possibly ask a writer and yet i i feel myself compelled to ask are you working on something right now or well i i've been very fortunate over this period i've had a lot of essays to write uh um, about different artists' work. It's mm -hmm. very fortunate for me um, that I, I do do this work. I have, I've, I've written some short stories and one short story had a character in it who um, is interesting to me, uh, developing her. And maybe, maybe, uh, there's something going on there. I do want to write a long fiction again. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those of us who write novels want to be in that situation I know. <laughs> again. I it know. It's really a reason reason to get up in the morning. I know. <laughs> it, it is. It is. It, it's it's when you're in that space where the the novel is a place you want to be most in the world. Is a it's a happy it's a happy a happy time. It's Lynn, th thank you so much. You've been so generous with answering all, all our questions and sharing everything with us. Thank you, Katie. I'm it's so happy that we could talk together. Likewise. Thank you. Thank likewise. You. And thank you, Greenlight. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lynn and Katie, so much for such a wonderful conversation. And thank all of you for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, a reminder that you can buy Lynn's book, Mother Care, and Katie's latest book, Intimacies, from greenlightbookstore.com. Uh, I am putting the link to that in the chat just one last time if you'd like to buy on greenlightbookstore.com, or you can visit us here in person. Um, and thank you all so much again once more for such a wonderful evening. Um, have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. We'll be in touch again. Yes, I hope. yes, and absolutely. Thank, thank you very much.